Everyone knows Michelle is a local hero. She's been inspiring since she was little, little. She's an amazing, humble athlete embarking on another part of her athletic career. So let's give it up for the one and only Michelle Parker. Wow. I'm so psyched because Timmy Kritz was one of my first ski coaches ever, and he just won that grand prize. I grew up going to Little People's Adventures, which was his camp, and it was like the best camp ever. So congrats, Timmy. Shout out to him. <laughs> Got to figure out this clicker. Um, right on. Whoa, it's snowing out. I'm so fired up. Thank you all for being here tonight. I feel like the Winter Speaker Series has become like embedded in our culture. It has become our culture here in Tahoe, and it's just an honor to be here, and thank you all for giving me the gift of your time. I feel like when I walk through these doors, I know just about everyone here, and even if we haven't necessarily had a conversation or ridden the chairlift together or shared the skin track, Likely, I recognize your face, and when I pass by you, that warms my heart. So y'all have raised me and, yeah, helped shape me to be the person I am today. So thank you so much. My slideshow tonight is called A Shift in Perspective. And when I was offered up the opportunity to come here tonight, I, without hesitation, said yes. Um, and then the last time I stood up here, I was with Emily Harrington, my co-pilot, which was amazing. And we had this epic tale to tell about flying to Ecuador on a Friday and coming back on a Sunday having skied a high altitude peak. And then I was like a deer in the headlights. I was like, oh, shoot, what am I going to talk about? My season this past year was so different than anything I've ever had before. And I remembered what a longtime friend of mine and mountain sensei and mountain partner told me one time. His name's Jim Zellers, by the way. He said, everyone has a story. And so I thought about my previous season, and I felt like it was one of the most formative seasons of my entire life, a year I will always remember. So this one, it might be a touch different than shows you've been to in the past, and this one is definitely dedicated to my dad my biggest teacher, my coach at absolutely everything. <laughs> That's my number one dude. If we haven't met yet, uh, and you have zero idea who I am, I won't hold that against you, and I'll give you a little quick introduction. My name is Michelle Parker, and I'm a professional big mountain skier. I was born and raised here in this beautiful place called Lake Tahoe. I am a huge lover of our community. Like, I really, really genuinely love you guys. Cheers to all of my local mountain partners. There's a lot of you here, and I just, yeah, I love you. I'm on a constant search for the joy in the in-between moments that can often go overlooked, like piggybacks on the bike, or staring deeply at the frost on my windshield after a cold, clear night, or the classic log hump. It's a sure way to get to the other side. But what I'm really driving at here is that when I think back on the moments that have made me the most proud in my career and brought the biggest smiles to my face, they aren't the mountains I've climbed, the awards I've won, or the podiums I've stood on. They are definitely taking my mom in the backcountry and skiing her favorite run at Palisades, or sitting on the deck of the chamois with my dad after a day of skiing and enjoying a beer, or likely my failed attempts at teaching my friends' kids how to ski. I don't know if you can see here in this photo, but this is my buddy Koa. He's almost four, and his father is a professional skier named Crispin Shetler. And this is how we were teaching him how to ski. It's unorthodox, but... <laughs> but my favorite moments are dropping into a run with my favorite people, or falling asleep with big aspirations for the morning, likely laughing about something stupid, or the conversations on a skin track. Those moments really, really get me. 
We have a tendency in the outdoor industry to celebrate the aspirational athlete, and I too think that achievements made by people are absolutely extraordinary and inspiring and motivating, and they leave me in absolute awe. And that's exactly what drove me for the better half of my career. This photo, we got Jim Morrison in the lead. Give it up for Jimmo. <laughs> And myself and Chris Davenport and Christian Pondella shot this photo in the Kachatna Spires in Alaska. But as a young woman coming into the scene at 15, I didn't know it was possible to be a professional big mountain female skier. And I garnered sponsorships through competing in slope style events across the globe and half pipe and the very first ever X Games for women in my sport. But I was groomed for sure by societal norms at that time in our recent history to have to prove that I belonged. Great 360 on a road gap in Utah, I really love that photo. <laughs> and I never quite felt good enough, and I constantly compared myself to my male counterparts. Thus, I had, and still carry with me, a tiny little chip on my shoulder. And that salty little chip drove me to want to be the very best and to push our sport as far as possible. To be clear, I don't view that salty chip as a negative. It really lit a fire within me and kind of fueled my entire career. But as I grew older, I noticed that winning didn't make me a better person. Losing likely did, actually. I left the competitive circuit behind to pursue what was actually my very biggest passion in life, and that was skiing powder with my friends and building communities centered in the mountains. This photo makes me laugh. That's me and Henrik Harlot on the left. I don't know if you all know him. He's a very famous slope style skier. Incredibly talented athlete. He's, he got famous for on the NBC, NBC Olympics. He was like, Wu-Tang Clan is for the children. I don't know if that rings a bell. That was a classic moment, though. <laughs> but we both won the Aspen Open, and his checks for $5,000 and mine's for $1,500. That was kind of the era that I grew up in. And then that's me and Elise Sogstead. And this is, like, community and, like, yeah, driven around being in the mountains together. She's one of the first female athletes that I got to go out with, and I no longer had to compare myself to men when I was out there with her, because we pushed each other and, like, I don't know, elevated our skiing. It was so, so epic to be out there with her. And I speak of the tendency to celebrate these massive achievements, only to bring me to my next point. I think it's really cool to just celebrate being outside. I think our community does a really good job of that. <laughs> I think it's really cool to invite people in. I think that's one of the most incredible characteristics that a human can have, is to truly share your passion with someone else. Let us not forget about those in-between moments, like sharing a lap with your mom or a beer at the chamois with your dad, because those moments will bring you joy for far longer than the fleeting feeling of hitting that big cliff or getting the best pow day. They're also in reference to the in-between moments of a ski turn, because, damn, that's such a nice moment, right? When you're just, like, weightless, floating in the sky. I love that. Although I must admit, some, admit something before I move on. A couple of years ago, it was like a couple of days after I unknowingly had torn my meniscus, and I found myself on a long boot pack up a rad line on the east side of the Sierra called She Light. And I was with Jeremy Jones. And I was chatting with him, and I was like, man, my knee hurts so bad. And he said in his classically monotoned, nasally voice, he was like, well, Michelle, I think you've hit the biggest cliff you're ever going to hit. <laughs> <laughs> right, Tim? He kind of sounds like that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> And I sure as hell tried to prove him wrong last year. I was going for it. I was like, Jer said, I'm not going to hit a big cliff. I'm going for it. But I don't think I succeeded. I blew up a lot. Anyways, I'm not, I'm not immune to searching for the biggest cliff and fiending for the deepest of deep days. But I won't forget to celebrate those in-between moments like traveling the world with my wildflower cookies and eating them everywhere. I've been a professional skier for 21 years. I've been at this for the better half of my life. And I primarily help to create films. I ski in those films. I teach people things about avalanche safety. I teach them how to ski. I work with brands to create the very best gear we possibly can. And in general, I just spread the love that I feel for the mountains to everyone. 
And there's a lot more that goes into being a professional skier nowadays than when I started, and it's been quite the journey. Some of y'all might recognize that rail on the left is at the entrance of Olympic Valley. Yeah, I, I did not let my dad come there on this day, but he helped me build the drop in. I smashed into those rocks a lot. <laughs> I don't know if you're all privy to what's been going on in women's skiing as of late, but if you watch the big air from the Olympics, that gives you a pretty, good damn, a pretty damn good idea. They're amazing. Women are doing things now that I never thought was possible, but it took the generation before me to stay, start laying those bricks down and building that road, and then there was my generation humbly asking for a spot at the X Games. And nearing the end of my competitive career, we were actually invited to compete in the Olympics. I didn't go. I chose powder instead. <laughs> but take a look at the latest roster on the Matchstick movie called Land of Giants. There are nine women in that movie. There's nine women. That blows my mind. Yeah, gone are the days when it's acceptable to only have one female in your film. This photo is actually from the filming of All In with Matchstick, which I believe was the first action sports movie to have 50% men and women, which is really cool. So in 2022, I pitched a film to Arcteryx featuring the majority of the women's team. In my mind, these, women's have been, these women have been pioneers in their respective sports. They've opened up doors for others behind them, and they have set the stage in their own unique way. So I built a team, got everyone on board, and ultimately went to town pitching and selling in the project to Arcteryx. I teamed up with Robin Van Jin, professional badass snowboarder and a total rock star of a friend, and my fiance, Aaron Blatt. Yeah, he deserves a cheers. Um, he owns a production company and has made incredible action sports movies, so these were my two co-directors along with myself. And in January, we started filming. We got the green light, the funding, and the stoke to make the film and it'll be premiering here in this building, January 20th. I hope y'all come. <laughs> the concept behind this film is loosely based on the idea of circularity. We had a tent made, that's the tent, from 137 unrepairable jackets that would typically end up in the landfill. And wherever we went, the tent went with us. So it's basically an action-based film with a nod to using less and skiing more. Our very first destination was here in Lake Tahoe. That's the tent all set up. This is up on Mount Watson. The crew flew in, we set up shop, and we kicked it off. It was amazing. It was January. It was snowing a ton. We had no idea it would become a record-breaking season. Pow was stacking up, and I was so psyched to have all of these incredible athletes in town. I love that photo. That's Lucy Stockbauer, another in-between moment where she's just levitating and dipping beyond the horizon. Another in-between moment. They're the best, guys. If you don't err in the middle of your turn, you should try it. <laughs> and then one day, I got a phone call from my mom, and she had said that my dad had snuck out in the middle of the night, and she and my brother had found him early in the morning. That little escape artist. Don't try to escape on me, Dad. <laughs> um, I took him to the neurologist the very next day, and we sat down in the doctor's office. Within five minutes, the doctor had diagnosed him with Lewy body dementia. It's a disease that I wish upon no one, especially my father, my best friend, my hero, the man in my life that stood by me since day one. But it made sense after noticing little things not quite adding up, and he's been dealing with what we think is Parkinson's for the last eight years as well. This is the only AI-generated photo in this entire <laughs> slideshow. <laughs> but it turns out that for those who have this diagnosis, you often don't go into REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep. And that's when your body's actually paralyzed. And so if you're dreaming and your body's paralyzed, you stay put. But if you have these lucid dreams and hallucinations, like one with these diagnoses might have, you might start acting out your dreams, hence him sneaking out. Um, if there's one thing you should know about my dad, it is his incredible way of looking at life with the utmost positivity. This news, however, hit me like a rock. It was the longest three hours I've ever spent in the doctor's room. Shout out to our local neurologist, because he spent three hours with us, and I don't think that's very normal, but he answered all of the questions, and when I walked out of that door, I knew that our lives had changed. 
For me, I knew that I wanted to be at his side during this time after all he's done for me. He's picked me up after six knee surgeries and raised me and yeah, I was not even thinking about it. I was like, I'm gonna stay here. He didn't blink an eye when I said I wasn't going to college for one year and one year became two years and two years became three years and him and my mom supported me the entire time. This photo is a great sequence representative of when I travel, he refuses to get a professional haircut. So he, he tends to look like a chia pet until I get home. So it kind of is a good telltale of how long I've been out of town. He's the one person that convinced me to pursue being a professional skier after I spent 33 days in the hospital helping a close friend recover from four brain surgeries after a traumatic brain injury. I had job applications in to other work, the towel was thrown in, and my dad sat by my side and patiently heard me out and said, think about it, and he convinced me to stay in it. Thank you, Dad. You are the best. He, uh, he also filmed, ooh, that wine's got a little ting to it. Love it. Um, he also filmed my very first ski part ever. I told Michelle she could be taped, so she's going to boogie and snowplow, I guess. <laughs> the boogie and snowplow. Y'all need to do it. I still do it every day. <laughs> Gosh, in 2022, in 2021, my dad landed the cover of GQ. Can you believe it? <laughs> Men of the year. I'm just kidding, but these are pretty great captions. <laughs> I think Aaron mocked this up after one of his haircuts, looking like the silver fox that he is. Fashion today, who even knows anymore? <laughs> But this is just a nod to adding humor to every aspect of our lives. Like when my dad does have these hallucinations of these figures that are everywhere, they might even be with us here tonight, and usually they're in his house and he wants them to get out. And one day he looked at them and he said, you guys really need to get a job and make some friends. And I, I like laughed hysterically and I was, that is such sage advice. And he laughed too, we started laughing together and that's often how our relationship works. But it was an easy decision to make, to stay home and film my video part here. I say easy in the sense that I didn't have any doubt in my mind that that is exactly what I was going to do, but it was definitely a mental adjustment. Thankfully, there was really good snow, as you can see. This was on a walk in my neighborhood up in the highlands. Can't see any of the houses. Almost too much snow. Props to making it through last winter, everybody. <laughs> And I absolutely love it when it snows this much in Tahoe. Like, the resort sometimes closes down, you jump off your roof, you build side hits in your neighborhood, it's glorious. But my family and I changed our pace of life a little bit, and we ensured that my dad had company. I missed a lot of Bluebird stable powder days for filming, and if you know any professional big mountain skiers, they sure as hell aren't doing that. But we played pickleball instead, and I met a slew of 60-plus-year-olds that kicked my ass on the pickleball court <laughs> and became my really good friends. I know some of y'all are out there. Shout out to my pickleball people. Challenge you any day. <laughs> and my dad and I were an unlikely duo. I would sit beside him and tie his shoes, pull his pants up, his belts miraculously never seemed to work. <laughs> Arcade belts worked for sure though. Um, <laughs> and I'd bring him his water bottle and his paddle and I'd have a good attitude and we'd get out there and my former professional tennis player of a dad would come alive. We kicked a lot of ass. Some days it was like magic. I was the runner and the jumper and he had all of the angles. It was beautiful. Challenge us to a match, I dare ya. The dichotomy of wanting to be two places at once, on the pickleball court and in the mountains, but I sure as hell would never take back those days on the court with him. The in-between moments are so pure and will stay with me forever. I got way better at pickleball, and I end endlessly searched the internet for father-daughter tournaments. If you know of any, please let me know. Much to my demise, I couldn't find them, but what became even more fun was our family tournaments, me and my dad versus my mom and my brother, or my mom and my fiance, and my dad and I always won. <laughs> and that was when I learned this beautiful lesson that will stick with me forever. Time is the most cherished thing that we have, and we'll never get it back. And how you choose to spend it is up to you. It is life's currency. 
making the most of it doesn't necessarily mean scoring every single powder day like I used to think. I started to let go of the old me that wanted to score every single powder day, and I shed this self-expectation that I had built up telling me I needed to be great and simultaneously redefined what being great meant to me. I found incredible contentment in the process of falling in love with simply being. I realized that finding contentment in just being was absolutely harmonious, and it made time stand still on those epically powder-filled days spent inside the Truckee Recreation Center playing pickleball with a bunch of 60-plus-year-olds while accompanying my dad. What a rad way to spend my time. I tried hard to find balance between being a professional skier and this new pace of life until one day I said, screw balance, I want harmony. I've been searching for balance all of my adult life, and I've found it to be unachievable. But harmony, I can get with that. Balance literally means an even distribution of weight, enabling someone or something to remain upright and steady. While harmony is defined by the combination of simultaneously sounded musical notes to produce chords and chord progressions having a pleasing effect, harmony sounds much more achievable to me, just to be pleased. Things can be off balance, but still pleasing. Cheers to Harmony. As the season continued on, we kept filming here in Tahoe. On occasion, I would have a teammate out here to film with, but for the most part, I filmed by myself and my incredibly talented friend named Rafe Robinson, the cinematographer pictured here, looking like a stud out in Alaska. <laughs> it's a trip to be in the mountains with just your filmer. From a safety perspective, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but it was how I was able to stay home. On the upside, no one else is going to hit that cliff or ski that line, so you end up stepping up, and it's really, really awesome. But you have to be incredibly on point. You have to be on point with your decision-making, your communication to your filmer, your exit strategies. You have to have complete confidence in yourself and your ability to read the snowpack, etc. One might think that, a little burp on the microphone, that wouldn't be good. <laughs> One might think that my head was spinning with all that life was throwing at me, but I actually found going into the mountains to be so grounding. I felt really sound and true to myself and in harmony. It felt really magical, in a sense, to stand on top of a line and challenge yourself and taking these deep breaths all by yourself, analyzing your every move far more than when you're with others. But I always had my filmer there. Shout out to Rafe. And I didn't, but it does feel like you're quite alone. Which brings up this concept that I was just chatting about with a friend of mine, Graham Zimmerman. Graham recently wrote a book called A Fine Line. He's an alpinist, and I believe Alpenglow Sports has a few signed copies in there. But he has this theory in there, and it's called The Hundred Year Plan. And I would like to live to be a centurion. I have no plans to go early. Imagine all of the incredible days you can have if you live to be 100. And when I really think about the why behind what I do, it's the people, plain and simple. Once again, it's not really the conditions of the snow or greasing the line or summiting a particular mountain. It's the people and partnerships that I've gained, and that is the why. Case in point. That was from last year, and I wish all of you many days like this with nonstop laughter. That makes me laugh and so happy inside when I watch it. I knew that the mountains have always been a really sacred space and made me feel something extra. It's where I've always felt like my best self, free to be exactly who I am. People often say that you go into the mountains to escape something, and I actually found it to be, like I said, really grounding. And I have my dad to thank for that. Through all of this, I have felt the deepest of gratitude for days spent outside doing what I love to do. Even more importantly, living closely with my dad instilled this renewed sense of living life on my own terms and listening to myself, setting up boundaries, focusing on the things that matter the most. Time with him allowed me to slow down. And I learned about who I am in a very different way than I do when I'm in the mountains. 
When I'm in the mountains doing hard things, facing fears and overcoming them, you really do get to know who you are. When you problem solve or work through a very real fear, there's parts of you that show up that you didn't know existed. And it's surprising, it's character building, and it's downright beautiful. These photos are from Alaska, from a top five run of my life. It was glorious. And the circumstance with my dad has cer certainly been challenging, and in that challenge, I'm getting to know myself even better, and far more deeply. In fact, it feels similar, not to be cliche, to overcoming hard moments in the mountains. For example, while voluntarily suffering or acing a big line, because of this newfound knowing of myself, I've felt more confident in myself than I ever have before. And I don't know if voluntarily suffering is depicted in this photo because this was me, I was departing with Cody Townsend and we were going off to ride our bikes to the Canadian border to ski a bunch of the 50 classics along the way. That's an example of voluntarily suffering. <laughs> and I stopped really caring about the small things in life that once bothered me and I felt really proud of how I was spending my time. As a professional athlete, it's really easy to get caught up in your performance, but looking back on the season, I am so proud and more proud than I've ever been in my entire career because I did exactly what I know I needed to do and I spent a lot of time with my family. While I filmed the entire season <laughs> through the month of March at home, I figured I could afford one trip in April. The athletes I was working with were really fired up to go on a human-powered expedition to Alaska, and I've been up there a handful of times on expeditions, a lot with Jim, a lot with other people, but I figured that I had garnered the skill set it took to produce a trip like that. This is from Denali in 2017, and I'm doing my best Adrian Ballinger impersonation on the left. It was right after he had summited uh, Mount Everest with no oxygen, and I was like, I could do this. <laughs> But that means you have to build the team. You have to figure out food for 10 people for two and a half weeks, charter private planes, get into the mountains, rent these vehicles and the hotels, and dial in the system so that you can also make a movie at the same time. Another shot from the Kachatnas with Jim Owen, Davenport. With the team built, in April we landed in Anchorage and we transported everyone and all of the gear to Talkeetna, Alaska, where some of the world's best bush pilots work out of. It also happens to be where you would fly to and from Denali. And we had a handful of locations picked out on Google Maps with different pins and ultimately would need to take a scout flight to check all the conditions all over this range and see where we wanted to land. So we took off on our scout flight and we flew nearly the entire range from the Tordrillos to Denali in these incredible planes called Otters. I'm obsessed with these planes. They can take off and land in very short distances and carry a heavy load, and they're really sturdy mountain flying planes. Built for the war, right, Jimmo? Yeah. Um, anyways, they're incredible, and you can fill them up with all your gear, and they're just so cool. So we took off, and our pilot, Paul, who's a total legend up there, this is him, and I just love the interior of these otters. And on our scout flight, it was a beautiful bluebird day. This is Mount Russell as we flew by it. And we're going out and scouting everything. <laughs> I think his name is Russell. <laughs> and the pin that we ultimately decided to land on was uh, given to us in a secret thread of emails from Travis Rice. And it was the location that we ended up going into called Nautilus. I don't know if you can read my t-shirt there, but this is just this summer with Travis, and he's looking like such a dork on the jet ski with his goggles on, and he makes me laugh. But thank you, Trav, for giving us this spot to go shred. So this is called the Nautilus, and this is just like this elevated glacier off the Dahl Glacier with beautiful terrain. It would have been so sick with like 10 more feet of snow. But as you can see, there's a lot of cliffs in there, and the whole like cirque is kind of guarded by some cornices, but it really did have the best snow, and we landed there, and we were like, sweet, this is the spot. On our way back, though, the clouds started to come in, and my pilot, Paul, was like, he, I was riding shotgun, and he's like, I think we might have to sleep out here. Like, we got to land. And I'm like, whoa, I'm not prepared for that, but that's okay. So we like land on this lake, and we start walking up, and I think he kind of knew that there were some cabins there, and we got greeted by this dog, and the dog comes out, and this lady comes out, and she's really confused, and she's like, what the hell are you guys doing here? You can only access this fishing lodge via plane. But after about an hour, she warmed up to us, and we had tea with her, and she was like, if you have to, you can stay here. 
but thankfully we were able to fly out and we went back to Talkeetna. This is at the Fairview, the local drinking place, the bar. And uh, they have amazing live music. We saw plays, the like, community's really active. It was wonderful. And of course, we had to prep for our trip though and we were kind of getting hunkered down to Talkeetna because of the weather. Some shots of inside the hangar of my favorite pilot, Leanne, otherwise known as The Raven. If y'all haven't checked out The Raven, it's a Yeti film. She is a really amazing, strong female aviator up in Alaska who typically has picked me up and dropped me off on most of my expeditions. This photo is uh, McKenna Peterson, Leanne, and myself on a previous expedition, and McKenna's like a really amazing big mountain skier. She's also the captain of a boat, like a fishing boat in Alaska, and Leanne's this like leading charge in female aviation up in Alaska, and I just love that energy when you're in the mountains. It's really, really special. So we packed up all our stuff. You gotta weigh all your gear in the hangar and load it up, and we brought a dog. <laughs> because why not? <laughs> <laughs> Here's Elena Height and Robin Van Jin. They were the other athletes on the trip. Elena with just the essentials, some beer and some whiskey and binoculars. <laughs> and we took off. And this is another shot of the inside of the plane, which I love. And that's Rafe sitting shotgun. And once you land out there on the glacier and it's just you and it's silent, the plane takes off and you're like, all right, the adventure begins. So you set up shop. This is the tent set up. I love this tent. And this is what your camp looks like. And over time, these trails start getting broken in, and it's kind of a little tent city, and you just build your community out there. This is the inside of our cook tent, which is quite extravagant for a human-powered trip, um, one might think. But we're making a movie, so we have 10 people out there. And this is Justin Sweeney. He's our chef, also our team manager. He just really wanted to come on the trip. And I was like, sweet, do you think you could help out with the food? And he did an amazing job. We got it catered, so there's a company in Alaska that basically like packs all the food up and they give you a binder with very clear instructions. It's really quite simple. So I give it to Justin and about on day two, I'm like, how's the cooking going? He's like, I don't know, there's weird words in there like boil and saute. <laughs> and I'm like, you're gonna nail it. You're doing great, <laughs> as you did. <laughs> Couple of shots showing my friend's abodes. There's Jeff Keenan and Robin Van Jin in their tents. We had beautiful sunny weather, and I'm not kidding, we really brought a dog. Um, this is Shane Treat, who I've been on a number of adventures with up in Alaska, and he's kind of a Swiss army knife, if you will. He builds and installs boilers by day, and then he loves to go skiing in the mountains, a solid mountain partner, a guide. It was so psyched to have an emotional support animal out there. And he also built this heater, which we had in the media tent, and it became quintessential. We film on the red cameras, which are the same cameras that they would film like an IMAX movie with. And we have drones and still cameras and GoPros and so many electronics, but if you can't keep that stuff warm, you can't make a movie. So this heater was like life-saving. Looks complicated. This is the mess of the gear that is to make a movie. But we kind of had to have it all in one spot and charge it up by the heater. And of course, the unsung heroes of making an action sports film are the cinematographers. We have Rafe and Jeff and Leslie Hitmeyer, and then my partner, Aaron Blatt. Got to give a huge shout out to Leslie Hitmeyer. She was the kind of, she kind of took the lead on this trip. I'm not going to lie. She came in as our on slope cinematographer. So she has the skill set to be on the snow with us and hiking these lines and shooting that top down angle. Total badass, helped everyone get organized, leave it to the female to get everyone on the same page. But she rocked it, and I'm a huge fan of her. And then I got to shout out Aaron Flat too, my partner, because this was his first winter camping trip. I've been training him on the slopes here in Lake Tahoe at Jake's, and he's been doing great. But he was panic shopping before we went out there. We went to every REI, and he had to bring a Class Azul thing of tequila. We were buying all kinds of snacks and stuff, and he absolutely nailed it. This is the bumper sticker on his split board. It says, if you think this is slow, wait till we go uphill. <laughs> but he's incredible. He is a world-renowned snowboard photographer and just never been on this style of trip, and I was like, we're doing it. He had to pass the test. And he did with flying colors. The, the images that you will see from here on out are primarily all of Aaron's, and they're some of my favorite images ever. And he really came into his own out there. And yeah, he was pretty psyched. So this is our first day. And there's on the left, that's a photo of Mount Russell in the background. It kind of became this pinnacle peak that is in a lot of our images. 
And on our first day, we went out and we actually decided to go to what we thought was like kind of the smaller, more approachable terrain. And it actually is, but it doesn't look so in this photo. <laughs> this is Robin Van Jin and Elena hiking up. And upon getting to the base of this line and boot packing up, we were like, oh, it's like brick. It's like really icy. But we hiked it nonetheless. And I'm super psyched because this photo is amazing. And this is me on top of my line, wandering around there all by myself. Um, yeah, it was just sheer ice. And we're like, OK, day one, didn't really get much done there. And you have a lot of time to stare at the mountains. And my favorite part about being in these mountains is unlocking them. Like when you sit at the base, you start to notice how you can make it up there without a cornice above you and how you kind of start to pick it apart and, again, just unlocking the mountains. Jer likes to call it mind surfing the mountains. That's exactly what it is. So on the second day, we ended up on top of these beautiful lines. There was like this really beautiful triangle of spines. And here we are topping out. I love this. It's a drone image. And this was kind of like zoomed in on that moment, traversing over to get to the top of the lines. This is Robin and Elena. Super psyched. I'm a skier. I could just get it right over there. <laughs> and again, Mount Russell in the background. And then I just love a good boot pack. This was kind of our elevator shaft to get to the top of those lines. And I was psyched. It was super fun. You could lap it and get to multiple lines and kind of spread out. And that's what it looked like on the way down. Still had your classic Alaskan rollovers to contend with. We found the snow on this face to be far better and far superior than the ice. You could ski it pretty fast, but when you're on a human-powered trip with no helicopter or means for access, you're kind of throttling it back just a hair. Some shots of the girls, Elena Height and Robin Van Jen on top, and our tent set up with some skin track art. The tent really comes alive at night. If you get inside it, it looks like a kaleidoscope of color. It's absolutely beautiful. And dog check-in. Dog is still doing good. Dog is doing great. Dog is helping us have a really good time. <laughs> I just love this image because it depicts winter camping to me. And it really kind of shows exactly who Robin Van Jen is. She's just going to get shit done. Like, she's going to fix her binding with a fork. And that's kind of what like glacier camping is. You just get it done. You figure it out. And a couple of be beautiful scenic images of like our circ of where we were at. Dog's still doing great, in case you were wondering. <laughs> Alma was really fired up. And luckily, we had great weather. I understand that it's a risk. We had a babysitter set up, but we decided to bring her anyway. And it's the people on these trips that really make it for me. Once again, there was never a dull moment. This is Rafe high kicking, probably falling on his bum afterwards. We had a little bit of snow for nice photos, but it didn't really stick too much. There wasn't too much that accumulated. And of course, I brought my baseball mitt out there because we had Tall City Softball League coming up and I had to train up. <laughs> but this photo, to me, these photos represent those in-between moments that'll stick with you forever the simple things that make you smile even amongst the biggest mountains in Alaska. Not in Alaska, like some of the biggest mountains, but Alaska has big mountains. Anyways, this is Rafe, and he had us rolling on the ground because he had his pet squirrel named Chippy, and he's acting like it's a film camera, but it's like these are the in-between moments that like, I think back on, and they make me smile big. This shot is just one of my favorites. I shot this on a film camera, and it's that Alpenglow time of night where you just stare up at the mountains, and again, you really do start to unlock them. So I noticed a couple of lines when I was looking up here, and I was like, okay, there's two more big ones that could go down. We're getting psyched on it. It's beautiful. The reflective light off of the ice is so stunning at that time. I just love it. And you have a lot of time to kind of ponder the meaning of life up there. And it's really nice to take a step back of the noise of everyday life and, and get away from cell phone signals. And for me, having produced this trip and directing the film and helping out with my family, it actually felt like I had a lot riding on this trip. Like I was like, whoa, this is the one time I'm leaving home to go do my thing. It was the one chance I got to go out in the mountains with the team and other athletes and do what I know how to do, but it felt really intense to step away from home. A normal year would mean that I travel the entire time and I find myself in powder-filled areas and it's totally great, but this year was a bit different. And the mountains, as they do, they humble you and remind you that expectations don't really matter. And things started to heat up and we actually, Elena and I hiked a line and we got like halfway up and it was really, really warm and 
think that's exactly when this started to shed, and we were in a protected spine area on a high piece, but we turned and we were like, we're in a t-shirt, like it's Alaska, like it's too hot, and there's cornices everywhere. So that ultimately kind of like marked the end of our time there of skiing really good snow. But as you do, when you go to these places time and time again, you kind of become friends with part of the local community. So this is my buddy Joey McInerney, and he's doing a little flyby. Joey owns the only weed shop in Talkeetna, and he's dropping us a gift out of the plane. If you can see that, <laughs> I'll leave it up to you as to what that was. <laughs> Attached to the gift was a pirate flag, and I think there's like the mountains erupting behind me, and I'm like, thanks, Joey, save the day. So as I mentioned, things are heating up and we start to notice, well, first of all, geez, look at that Northern Lights photo, it's amazing. That became like the cover of our movie, the pinnacle photo of our entire trip. Absolutely love it, that's Aaron behind the lens. But we noticed this like north facing zone with a bunch of ice that was like pretty well protected and it looked like it might have the best snow and we got over there and there was this really cool tunnel of ice. You can see I'm on the left there and Robin Van Chin's walking in there. Before we stepped foot in that terrain, though, I think it's important to note that we probed the entire zone. This is Ben Hoynes. He was the guide that came out with us. And I think as an athlete, like, I feel like we are very competent in the mountains, but it's really nice to have a guide out there just to have that extra safety in case anything happens and to have a nice sounding board to speak to about things. So we probed the whole zone. Got some absolutely incredible photos. Like, the ice just gives this other otherworldly look to it, and I was really fired up on these shots. And we built a little jump out of that tunnel, and I hit it, and I did my signature shifty that I love so much. Didn't think much about it. And then it ended up on the cover of the latest ski journal. I was so psyched. <laughs> it has been a long-term relationship goal of mine and Aaron to get the cover of a magazine. He gets a lot of covers in the snowboard industry, but I was like, Babe, we're pa I'm past my prime, like, we're never gonna get the cover. And then, <laughs> this thing showed up just the other day and I was like, oh my gosh, what a cool thing to get a cover with your partner. That's so special. And I was really fired up, because, thank you. you. You work really hard, you like produce a trip, you're directing the film, you're writing the gosh darn article, you're taking photos, all this stuff, and I'm like, oh, it's just not quite working out. We were on the glacier for like five days, maybe six days total, and this was just like, oh, so psyched. So we celebrated, naturally. <laughs> Ringing the bell with the ice axe. And it was like our last night before we shot that photo. This is actually before we shot the photo, but we did live it up in the tent. We had like a little DJ set up and we put some lights on and we were filming each other. It was really a good time. Another epic photo of the tent under the night sky. I love Alaska and the northern lights there. Something very, very special. And as the trip's coming to an end, the forecast was getting extra grim. Like we had weather on the front end of our trip and weather on the back end. The forecast was like 170 mile per hour winds, torrential downpour of rain and we're like, we have enough food to weather the storm, but I think we should probably get out of here. So on day six, we packed up our stuff, and it's this really bittersweet moment, because when you land on that glacier, you're like, I'm gonna be out here for a month. Like, I wanna move here, actually. This is amazing. But we packed up our stuff, and then you end up just roasting on the glacier if you're a little bit on the earlier side waiting for your plane. But the plane came, we got out of there. Aaron was probably more psyched than I was to take off there. <laughs> Last little view of Mount Russell before landing in Talkeetna. Um, <laughs> this is what you do, I guess, when you land in Talkeetna. You buy furkinis for the winter time and you have a couple of drinks. <laughs> and just so you know, I have kept in touch with Alma. I got to see her in Vancouver this summer for a day. It was a really awesome moment for us. And then I landed in Reno and I'm like, <laughs> This is so great. I was so fired up. I was like, the skiing's still good. We're coming home. We're going to the mountains, guys. I almost wanted to give them a ride. Like, they were renting the car in their boots. I was so psyched. <laughs> if these guys are in the audience, I love you. <laughs> but I had a lot to look forward to coming home to Lake Tahoe. We had an incredible winter. The skiing on the east side was really warm, but really fun. 
had wildflower peanut butter cookies to look forward to, and I had my mom and dad to come home to. Look at those studs. <laughs> I hope you still have that yellow dress, mom. <laughs> Dad's looking extra studly there. And this is one of my absolute favorite photos of my dad. I think it speaks to his never-ending ability to look at life in a very positive way. And despite all that he's going through, and I wish that I could be in his shoes to truly understand, but he's remained so incredibly positive. And that's helped me to remain really positive as well. And I think about that. That's top of mind whenever I'm hanging out with him. Love that smile. But I'm not here to preach about false positivity. To be clear, I get that we all land on our face sometimes, much like I did trying to land this 180 off this cliff. Emotions and stressor stressors, they're a cycle, right? Emotions work in a circle, and you have to complete the circle. You have to feel the emotions and let yourself cry without judgment or whatever that is. And my dad used to give me 10 minutes when I would blow my knee to really let it all out and cry. And then when it was time to get to business, to healing, he was like, right, you've had your 10 minutes. And I don't know if he knew the psychology behind that, but it's true. Like, it's a circle. You've got to complete the circle to let them flow out of you. And so thanks, Dad, because he taught me that when I was younger. And surprisingly, you don't typically need 10 minutes. And I wasn't gone for that long, but got to give him his haircut which is just this in-between moment that I love so much. It's my favorite thing ever. He's getting a lot of haircuts lately. And it was also very, very clear to me that life felt far more harmonious when I was home with these people. I love picking my mom up like that. She hates it. <laughs> and this slide is just to give my mom a shout out. Look at how cool she is with her Headphones on, skiing at Palisades. I don't know who you're skiing with, but he's got the boom box in his backpack. <laughs> it's so sick. <laughs> and she is addicted to skiing, and she passed that on to me, and I'm so thankful, and I wish I could take her with me everywhere. And more importantly, I'm just beyond thankful for my entire family. We've all showed up and stepped up in different ways, especially my brother, my mom, and my dad, and there is so much love there. And to Aaron, who sends me selfies with my dad when I'm on trips, and he plays him music, and, he bring, and music seems to bring my dad right back into the present, and he usually starts singing and rhyming like his old days, which is absolutely lovely. So you may have walked into this room with a different set of expectations than what I gave you tonight. I did weave in a little micro expedition to Alaska, but ultimately what I'm doing right now with my dad is the biggest expedition I've ever been on. And this is the dance of life right now that's forced me to get a creative approach to my career, and it's absolutely changed the way I perceive my career and has instilled in me a newfound perspective that I'm really, really grateful for. We should celebrate the pow turns and the meaningful conversations, the real stuff that will keep our mental health in line for a lot longer than, than the fleeting feeling of absolutely scoring. We should lift those up who haven't had a chance we should strive to be pillar, pillars of our community rather than to use those pillars to climb to the top. It's incredible to ski powder with our mountain community and celebrate the simple joy of just being in the mountains. It is such a privilege that we have even to be out there in the mountains, to have the money and support and access that we have and the time. It's absolutely rules to take my 73-year-old mom on a hike to a place she's never skied before, have a snack a third of the way up, not summiting anything, not breaking any sound barriers on the way down, but just watching her ski so fluidly and filled with joy. So this winter, I want all of you to focus really hard on these in-between moments, the ones that often go overlooked, like the joy of watching the snowfall, and the incredible winter light dancing on the white backdrop that is winter, and the way that the snow insulates the ground and silences the noise, and the lichen growing in the most inhospitable locations, living it up. And the sunrises, the pinks, the oranges, the blues welcoming the day. The sunsets, always strive to watch the sunsets, especially from the east shore. Or the absolute beatdowns the mountains can give you when you turn away from the summit 300 feet away and you're scraping ice off of your goggles with an ice axe. <laughs> Celebrate those moments and those moments when you feel like you're on another planet. 
or exploring our backyard and all the little nooks and crannies that you've never seen before. Shout out to Ming Poon, that was his photo, my dude. <laughs> and those moments when everything absolutely lines up. Take extra special care to savor those moments and take extra care to spend life's currency on the things that you really truly appreciate. So thank you all so much for spending some of your life's currency with me tonight. I appreciate you so very much. though, I don't think this is complete without my family up here with me. If I could get my dad and my mom and my brother up here. Come up here. Yeah, come on up here. You want us to turn around? My dad is the biggest sap, you guys. Like, one time, <laughs> we were, look at Ming up there. <laughs> we were walking down the street, and uh, I'm walking with my dad, and there's this girl, and she walks up beside us, and she's like, we're like, hey, how's it going? We're talking to this girl, and, and she's like, oh, nothing. I just graduated college. It was really awesome. And I'm like, cool. And my dad just breaks down. He starts crying. And I'm like, and we walk away, and I'm like, who was that, Dad? And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so this is normal, and I love him so much. Thank you all so very much. That was awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you back here on January 4th for Jim and John Morrison, the one and onlys. We do have a limited number of posters that Michelle's going to hang out and sign after the show, so come on up front and meet her in person. Thanks for coming. Thank you.